welcome to the old city of Leviathan. We got the cast here. So let's thank these people. It's an awesome game. Uh, writing, level design. We got Bob. Art direction is red. Voice acting, Ryan Cooper. Soundtrack, Simon Heath. Etrium Kasseri. Soundtrack's amazing. Sculpting, Joseph Riggins. Programming, Kayanya Freeman. General Art, Dakiem Young. General Art, Yaroslav Yershkov. Sound Design, Alex Mikazjelo. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing any names. Video editing, Alex Zemstov, concept art, Soren Giotina, web development, Smooth Porcupine, PR Lewis, Denby. Let's get right into a new game of this. Um, because that's really all you can do. And um, we will make sure to get everything possible. Uh, I'll make sure to walk around a place forever. A broken mind. Let's see. The old city. Storm. Me. Chapter One. Hello again. I guess it's time for us to chat, as is our routine. Not to imply that this is unwanted. In fact, I think I'm growing rather fond of you. Hmm. You and I have shared a grand nothingness, and I feel as though your belly is a suitable embassy amidst the unknown above. A map. An embassy. The unknown above. So we're pretty deep down in some sort of labyrinth, maybe. Yeah, so... G-U-O. There's one there. And there's one there. That's three circles. Let's see, what's this? What's every room? This isn't that one. It's gotta be that one. And the entrance is opposite G-U-O. Maybe they, we can't trust that. It's 31st of January. It's over here. Okay. Sorry, January. I often wonder how many times I've woken up to greet you. Hundreds, if not thousands of days have gone by, surely. I can't believe you had not shown them to me. Solomon, my dear Solomon, yes. I met him near the south side of this facility. We had a wonderful chat, and I don't want you to feel jealous. A friendship between us would never develop to eclipse my friendship with you as he distanced himself from me after mentioning a woman named Belle. The poor fellow was unable to rid his mind of her. Some long-lost friend from an old-timer, I think. Glad I'll never lose you, Leviathan. Our relationship is a special one. Here's a typewriter and a letter. Um, did I write this? said something about moving north towards happiness and commit contentment. I get the sense that this was a s simple sarcasm, but that often gives way to an actual desire. I do not hope he finds what he's looking for. After all, he is making an effort to explore. That's more than I can say for the other minotaurs down here. 
The one whose residence is near the dumping point for clean water is bad enough, but the new one, this Moses character, does nothing but whine about his precious dwellers and their unwillingness to move. Where's your movement, Moses? To be fair, he did leave the other day. He said he was meeting with the order camp somewhere north. The order camp. February 5th. He's back. Not Solomon, no. The other one, Moses. Just down the way. It's so hard to keep track of all the minotaurs these days. Ah, uh, but I'm sure you know them all. You're a perceptible one, aren't you? Anyway, he's back and I feel compelled to go and meet him again. I'm quite the social butterfly, I'll have you know. Granted, whenever I attempt dialogue, I usually get the same tired story about how insane I am or other sub nonsense. Moses doesn't like me. He had the nerve to say that you don't exist. He said that I am some idiot bumbling, spewing my mind to you. Well, Moses, I'm no fan of your work either. One more February 7th. The fool. He's made the switch. At least that's what they say. I made the switch once, and my mind is never fully recovered. I embraced the void, but I resurfaced quickly enough to survive. What have you... Why have you done this, Moses? Why have you dived into uselessness? After I switched to the unclean water began to began to see the world for what it could be. Oh vast of nothingness. I can only really rely on you to unveil re the reality again, Leviathan. You must show me what they have done and what this place is, lest I implode in my own abyss. Oh, oh we've got some time here. April. He's gone. No longer will he exist as a parasite in your belly. He's made his escape. His journey to Tarshish. I cannot help but feel as though he is brave in doing so. On the other hand, here I sit, alone, with nothing to show for myself. I've become static. I sit here consuming the supplies from the old city, never even considering the sources, what sources might hold. Shall I continue to rot? Perhaps I should drink of the unclean water again. After all, if I am useless, there's no reason to not to dissolve. No, I will continue. I will cling to sanity like a man lost in his hope, and I will cling to your innards like the parasitic worm I am. Thirtieth of November. It has been long enough. I've wasted away being useless for enough time to see that there must be a change. Tomorrow, Leviathan. Tomorrow I will make my journey. I will reach the surface and I will find the old city. I will find the sources. Jonah. Alright. Well, there's nothing else to do here. Empty box. Minotaur resistance. There's definitely... Oh no, it's just more building. But there is some light. Maybe... Maybe, just maybe out there. Maybe there's a sun. And not just all these artificial lights. Wait. Authorized personnel to keep out. Or watch your step. Um, um, let's go with plants. Oh, there's some mushrooms too. Well, this looks like there could be some hope. Also, things are kind of falling apart. Oh, the source overflow outlet 47A. Oh, maybe that's the tainted water? Mushrooms, plants. Oh, 
do you want me here? I know the question must seem odd, if not insulting, but I really must ask. You seem distant as of late. Charles Warren. Distant. Oh man. Well, I can jump a little bit, but not, not strong enough to jump over this. Here's the water. The source. Follow the water. But the source. What? Excuse me? Um... Let's go find ourselves a giant beetle. Please and thank you. Or was it a crab? Fast enough, fast enough. This way. Twelve. Uh, sewer main, water source main. Nope. That was sewer access B. Oh. Oh, ladders got caught. Lights. Admittedly. And please do not take offense. You know, it's sometimes frightening me. Even in the complete safety of a valley to myself, there are places like this that I do not want to know. to get to that crab. Alright, these lights leading us. Leading us up there. But what about what's down there? We don't go we need to go up, right? But what's down here? I wonder if the dwellers would cluster together like rats if they really understood the true value of isolation. All of their pathetic little wars and ridiculous assumptions of superiority would be washed away if they all had their own private labyrinths to roam around in. Granted, they could never understand the importance of the individual. The megalomania of justice in the guild, order, and, yes, even the unknown. It's far too strong. There really is no point in even attempting dialogue. Um, I mean, he said it best himself. We can't get through here. To the sources. That is a dead rat. And a can of Viva to the sources. All right, wait, wait, wait. Is this what we want to do? This is where that giant crab was. What about? I mean, we can go... There's another path we can go forward, but... What's down here? Hold on. Maybe there's something down here. Pigs waste what is not swill. Nice. Oh. Uh-oh. It looks like, uh, is this some of the bad water? Did it get spilled? Yeah, that looks like, uh, maybe some people drinking. Did I drink the water? Let's go forward a little bit, and then, I mean, it, we can turn back 
We can keep going. We'll find out. Fire. There's the water source to follow the sources. That's it. Resistance that way. But what is what's this other way? This is kinda down to the left. Resistance. Oh, that's just a room. I'll come back to it later. What's down here? Storage. Kinda <clears throat> it's just a door. Epsilon. Storage. Huh. My father showed me in the heavens. Ziz flies, his wings like the clouds. He darkens the skies. Still behemoth is roaming in his desert unknown. The dunes reaching forward where no seed is sown. Under these beasts, near the depths of the abyss, Leviathan's creeping, Shoal's prince of Dis. Ava guided me onward by the strength of his hand. I let slip between my fingers, my grasp of the sand. He wondered, curious, do you know where you are? Indeed, I did not. All I could see was the blue. I told him plainly, it does not matter. I'm right here with you. Light switch. this? What? I shouldn't be here. towards the light. Sounds like there's electricity everywhere. Is that someone? Oh, there's a. There's statues. this happy and content fire behind bars Please. 
I cannot swim this deep. Let me out. Please. The certitude of the ancients comes with a new coat, annihilating those deemed anachronistic. Indeed, Dover runs red. So, is that a person? As a child, before the lots were cast, my parents moved around a great deal. The state of motion was not constant, of course, but it was frequent. Honestly, I love the newness of it. I love feeling like a sculpture, clay added over and over, but with an artist always ready to carve from my form that which I did not require, what? continually reshaping my psychology. Bags in front of me during the unfortunately early hours before departure, they seem to decrease in number with each successive voyage. Peace in number with each successive voyage. Um, okay, so let's say that we are in water treatment, right? So we go this way, whatever that means, and then you gotta do a couple of zigzags. We'll see docks, but then that's not going to be it. Keep going. <clears throat> you got to go past the docks to the left to get out of the old city. Wait, are we in the old city? Are we getting into the old city or out of the old city? Where are we? What did he say? Notes 784. It's funny, isn't it? Months into travel and at the end of it, I'm left with absolutely nothing. They told me that I should seek out the water treatment facility on this northwest portion of the island. They told me that if I found it, I would be met with a conglomerate endeavor to reach the inland. I was told that the Order and the other enemies of the guild would not interfere with our attempts at progress. No one ever told me that the conglomerate endeavor in question was simply the continuation of the same pointless struggle against nothingness. Okay. This is the next one. 785. I suppose this is my punishment for assuming movement has any worth. Miles and miles I ventured, all of this time spent, all of this pain endured. And here I sit with nothing to show for it but a dirty old mattress and a stagnant mind. That's the best part of it all, really. The best part is that I haven't changed, and the same idiot stumbling around in a fallen world that I was years past. Luckily, now that death is finding me like an old lover, Rejected yet loyal. It doesn't matter that the dwellers don't seem to be concerned with the inland. It sounds like this note writer's 
second. Stop writing notes soon. 786. Then again, why would they be concerned? Why would they want to find meaning? A meaning in that old city that the old city must provide if they already have their own. What need would there be for change? I am so horribly idiotic, aren't I? I should have seen it. No matter. It's about to be over, thankfully, and this pathetic waste of a life won't be here to trouble anyone anymore. Onwards with your endeavors, then, dwellers. I'm sure you'll make headway with your enemies some day. Surely it won't result in the continuation of infinite conflict that will never be resolved, surely. By the greater eye, what a fucking joke it is all. It all is. I said that wrong. Uh, 787. <clears throat> I met a local minotaur named Jonah. He's a friendly reminder of sanity's fragility. Drank from the unclean water, no doubt. In speech, he seems normal until a point, and that point is his dive into the bazaar. I would call it pretentious if it wasn't so obviously born of pure insanity. I guess I can't complain as it's far better than the nonsense I hear from the guild. At least Jonah doesn't make wakeful promises of inland ventures. No, he's firmly planted in this place. As if stuck in a loop, he keeps returning to vague memories of his childhood. As if they can protest, protect him. In the middle of a thought, He'll just bring it back from the void, just to make everything seem safe. Oh, Jonah. Minotaur. That's us. We're Jonah. We're Jonah. We're Jonah. This kid... That can't be Jonah. That can't be Jonah. No. G-U-O. Okay. Okay, we already went that way. That was the the high. Um, yeah. Ooh, down there is the unclean water, which we may or may not have been drinking. Maybe we haven't been drinking it. Oh. To the source. Been there. Now, we go up. Make the leap. What is this? Maintenance, Residence 13, Water Source. Ooh. Water Source or Residence. That is a good decision. Let's check out the Water Source first. down here. Oh, 21. There's a lot of it. Here's the source of the water. Is this how you get the water? Yes. Oh, 21. Now we gotta go back. Yeah, we did the loop. We did the loop left. And to the get the water. Now we come down to the residence. Would you be angry with me if I removed his work? I'm not exactly a fan. 
Before I assumed this portion of your stomach, he existed as a parasite, eating away at your flesh before making his escape. I'm told that he refused to accept the sustenance you haul in from the outside. Some say he went insane after attempting to live off of the unclean water. <sighs> Poor fool. Water treatment, subway access. So subway. What did these say? Entry one, entry two. All right, they're good. They're numbered. January twenty fourth. Oh, okay. This endeavor is new to me, but I suppose no other of my kind has written a journal of their discoveries. At least, none that I have read. Why is that? I wonder. Why do the others? The spread thin in this hellhole prefer talking to themselves aimlessly and without end. They wander in the dark, spewing their minds as if the walls themselves were engaging them. No matter. The walls will not hear my thoughts. No, my thoughts are for you, reader, whoever you are. January 25th, the next day. I met with the order camp near the down subway car today. It's always interesting how they, and the others down there, have taken into living in our collective filth. Though, I suppose the grass is always greener, only when you can see the other side. If I can... If I can plan some sort of coordinated effort to get to the surface, I think we can travel much faster. What we need is a rigid system and cooperation. I see where this is going. 26, the next day. <clears throat> Back when I was dubbed Minotaur by the Council of Modernity, I assumed the title granted me at least a modicum of authority over the logistical affairs. This doesn't appear to be the case with the Order Camp, however, as they've rejected me outright. The title seems to distance me from them. Sometimes I feel as though the Council is no better than the rabble of premods that they combated. The premods themselves are almost entirely eliminated. But our current populace is just as stubborn and unwilling to change their current status. Today I decided to use a different tactic than I had used before. Instead of pulling rank, I opted to use reason. As common dwellers, we are all aware that our supply of water and food is largely provided by the old city. It is clear that this entire supply is simply the leftovers of a much larger meal. A hand me down from some other entity in a much better financial situation. While this free sustenance is appreciated, wouldn't you rather find the source? Apparently, I alone have that sentiment. I will try harder. Entry 5. February 3rd. Wait. 26, 27, February 3rd. Okay. It's been a week since my last entry. I've tried everything. These people are intolerable. I've tried every measure of reason to no avail. they just rather drink the old city's charity water than find its fountain. I don't know how much longer I can take this. Every time I give a reason to escape this underground purgatory, it becomes more evident to myself how badly I personally need to get out. And every time they refuse, it becomes more obvious how hopeless this situation really is. What? Epsilon. G U O. Water. G U O. Always water. Solomon's note unlocked. Oh, did you see that? It's a little labyrinth. Minotaur's labyrinth. Okay. Um, I think there's nothing left to do but go to the exit. Right. Down. No smoking. Make the leap. Take the elevator. We're 
on one. Shall I ascend to your lungs and feel your breath? I think that would be lovely. <laughs> I think that's it. Solomon's Note 1, 4th of January. My name is irrelevant. My name is Solomon. This is Solomon's Notes, apparently. My name is irrelevant, and I am alone. Since the fall, everything has become irrelevant. I often wonder if this opinion is a realization brought about by the fall, making it true even before, or perhaps... Their irrelevance is the result of the fall. But the matter itself is as irrelevant as my name. Another more relevant matter is that of the cause of the fall. Unfortunately, I cannot help you there. All that I know is that it is not. it was not sudden. Society collapsed like an aging mind, losing its organization slowly without being cognizant of the decline. There was no single event that I can trace. It was not violent or chaotic. There is no dramatic shuffle. No, we fell gradually and painlessly as the structure simply melted away. So I cannot give you an accurate macro story. There is only this micro perspective. I do not have a legitimate reason to write this perspective, of course, and it seems particularly unlikely, given our current, let us say, dilapidated climate, that anyone will even discover this mental village, much less read and find value in it. Regardless, I will write of my perspective all the same. I will write of a great many things. In fact, I will write countless notes until that long awaited day of my release from reality because legitimate reasons are for those who have attempted to grasp some sort of structure. The structures are gone, it is all gone. All that is left is an empty world for me to wander aimlessly with all the pomp of a king, as if my continued existence were anything but the result of a biologically programmed will to survive and a cowardice to stifle nature's plans. Certainly, I would prefer to be dead, and I can imagine this depresses you. You should not worry, though, because this is not the sort of suicidal will that is born of an intense sadness. Rather, this is the desire for death born of a hollow life. The end, at this point, seems like an unfinished work on an already pointless existence. Thus, you should not worry as if I am in pain or as if I am some unwounded animal that should be snuffed out to stop the suffering. There is no suffering. There is nothing. I am no longer anything, and thus I am useless. Useless things should be tossed aside like garbage to be incinerated. Beyond this, the worry would be unwarranted on another level. I suspect that if you find these, I will have died well before. I should note that I am fully aware of the other survivors, reader. There are a few in this complex, although I really do despise that term. Although the present humanity I am one of the last who is old enough to remember the fall, and I know that it, it was far less drastic than our stories typically tell or told. To call us survivors is to imply that the fall was something difficult to survive. There are not nearly as many of us around, certainly, but that's because we stopped breeding and spreading out, not because we died. The fall brought about stagnation more than death, and stagnation brings a different kind of decay. It brings a slow decay. Like me, our world became useless, and the natural process of crumbling took over. So at last, a simple question, single question remains. That is, should you read this at all? At this point, it should be obvious that I cannot give you any reason to do so. You are one of two types of people. The first type, the type that is far more common, 
is someone who has only ever known the fallen world. The second type, one that you probably, one that you are probably not, is someone who has lived just long enough to recursively recognize the decline. To the first, these notes will be extremely depressing. To the second, these notes will present nothing that has not already been seen or felt. There is no third type of person who could find this useful. They are all gone. My name is irrelevant. I am alone. Note 2, 6th of January. We got a lot to go. It occurred to me that these notes will unlikely be found in my home. Likely. Meaning a description of the place is unwarranted. Therefore, rather than give you an image of what is undoubtedly the least tasteful residence in existence, I would like you to think of this particular note as a series of directions. Only follow these directions if you are so inclined to discover my material life like a detective searching for clues leading to a murder. Murder, incidentally, was what those of us before the fall called intentional killing of another human being. We had structures in place to discourage and prevent that sort of thing, never really changing the fact that people wanted to do so all the same. Anyway, you should start by examining my desk. There you will see my typewriter and my papers. The unused papers are sealed away in the drawers on the right side, so as to prevent decay. The spare ink is similarly protected. You might find use for those now that I am no longer requiring them, <clears throat> and I do hope that you'll keep the typewriter somewhat intact. I realize that it has potential as a wellspring of scrap, but I have deep fondness for it as machinery. It has its use. It carries out semi-flawlessly without question or complaint. I admire that about machines of old. Oh, that reminds me. I should also mention my pens. If you check the third drawer from the top on the left side of my desk, you will see a collection of unused mechanical pens designed for writing by hand, similar to chalk or pencils that you're probably familiar with. The pens have a store of ink inside them, much like a typewriter, so they are somewhat limited. Do take care of this equipment. I am aware that writing as an endeavor is not something humans seem to have kept from our pre-fallen state, but it is extremely important that someone continues to write who is more capable than myself. With these tools, I am just as useless as before, but someone with more con content can produce something of worth. Moving along, on the opposite side of the room there is a brick wall with wooden boards sitting at the base. If you would like to use this room as a residence, I am now obviously not in a position to decline, not that I would have had I still been alive. Indeed, if you do take this room, the brick wall you see there will become extremely important to you. If you examine it closely, you will see that some of the bricks, the ones at eye level, are loose. The windows are closely boarded for obvious reason. But these loose bricks provide a quick way to observe the exterior world. Avoiding surprises is always a useful way to avoid release from existence. It's best to keep watch of your own prison, I find. Of course, if you're caught by surprise, there are various clubs and spears under the mattress near the kerosene lamp. Oh, but who am I fooling? I'm sure you have a better collection of weaponry. Finally, you should be aware of my storeroom. There's a floor panel in the middle of this upper room that acts as a door to a basement. There you'll find a great wealth of canned food. Most of it may have spoiled by now, but some of the simpler materials should be edible, or at least marketable. Along with the cans are several can openers hanging on the wall beneath the stair. This irreplaceable and curiously simple tools seem to be the most valuable asset in our world. Also, and this final instruction is incredibly important, do not introduce heat into this basement. It has considerable airflow from the outside world because of its barred but open windows on two orthogonal walls. So it's always quite cold. Food does not spoil if it is refrigerated, which is an old way of saying chilled. We had large machines that did this for this, some of which you may have seen littering the old residence areas, but we have to resort to other means of achieving this effect now. Once the seasons turn and summer approaches, you'll need to scavenge for more canned resources. This is the most dangerous time of the year. While I'm sure you're capable enough, you should be aware that the heat of the sun will prevent the refrigeration effect that I previously mentioned, spoiling your new material. Do your best to find more, 
and eat only what will spoil quickly, so that you can save canned material for the winter. I'm not sure of the route you took to get into this complex, but the only entrance I'm aware of is a single door on the south side. The main double doors should be completely blocked off from the interior. I made sure of that. The single door is easily accessible, but it's also easy to defend. I recommend some sort of blocking system that you can move to and from the door on the inside, though traps may be more suitable for you. Personally, I could never stomach that thought. It was though traps may be more, uh, not due to a sensory or even emotional in inability, mind you, as I have seen enough to be fairly immune to the disgusting nature of the death process. Rather, I could never justify taking a life, or even maiming one, to protect one that is undeemably lesser. Oh, and while considering the topic of protection, I will say that you should avoid other scavengers over the course of the summer, even while you are outside of this complex. I can't really make the case that they are terribly malicious, but people have a way of abandoning decency when their quest for prolonged life is jeopardized. That is to say, canned food is obviously sparse, and they will fight you for it just as they'd fight you for my abode. I only bring this up because, in the old times, we all expected the world to turn into a dangerous place after any sort of fall. I guess we had adopted the idea so as to justify the structure. In truth, the world did not become more dangerous, rather it became quiet. Sleeping on its deathbed, humanity clings to life for no other reason than inst instinct, all the while deserving nothing but a swift end. Ah, but what am I saying? You know this. Again, you are here. You are fit. You are conquered. You conquered the obstacle of your own mortality to arrive at mortality's playground, and I would suggest you feel pride if the whole ordeal wasn't so manifestly pointless. On that note, I do not know why I'm even bothering to help you. I think that I already like you because you managed to find my residence. I suppose that demonstrates at least a modicum of talent. I have none of that, at least none that would matter in this world, so I appreciate it in you, reader. For all I know, well, I don't know anything, do I? I'm dead. I should say, for all I would have known, you could be a terrible person. You could be one of those who sacrificed destiny, decency, and empathy at the altar of pragmatism, as if your actions aren't excusable because of your fear of death. Still, you would possess talent all the same. Interestingly, people of this sort existed well before the fall, that is, vile people. I often get the sense that you and the others view the pre-fallen world as some sort of mythical place of happiness and good. Nonsense. People were just as terrible. The fall acted as a great unveiling force for the observation of these people. The only difference between this world and the old one is that we now experience considerably less comfort. Comfort, it seems, acts as a mud in otherwise clear water. It became difficult to see just how terrible humanity was through the various social cues and structures we adopted, tricking ourselves into believing that we were evolved. I don't feel proud of it. I don't feel proud that I saw what people were through what they thought what they pretended to be. Even before the fall, I was a misanthropist. Can you blame me? If you think I'm wrong, then you're an idiot. If you think I'm pointlessly negative, then you are asking me to lie. Dishonesty is by far the most offensive crime, and to lie to myself is worse than to lie to anyone else because I spend more time with myself than others, making the prospect even more dangerous. If I were to lie about what people are in order to make myself happy, all I would accomplish would be making myself one of them. I would make myself a rat by ignoring the pack. To be fair, it could be simply social idiocy. The idea has, presented, has been presented to me by essentially everyone I've ever known. Through the number of said individuals is frightfully or perhaps luckily minuscule, the phrase sad freak has been uttered several times. However, outside perspectives tend to be the most accurate by nature of being inherently macro. 
I would love to believe that there's some misleading, missing piece within the complex of social life effectively justifying behavior that would otherwise be obviously abhorrent, but there is not, it seems. People are more than apparently terrible. They manage to ignore that through social fluff, because they are selfish. I am selfish. I am incredibly selfish. My selfish nature is manifested in that I hide away from normal people out of my disgust for them. Honesty has this effect. The others have a selfish nature that is exhibited by their continued and pointless attempts to manipulate one another for some fleeting gain. You, for instance, are probably one of the worst, just by nature of being here now. What debauchery do you enjoy, I wonder? How often do you manage to convince yourself that trying to maintain the good is not realistic? Ask yourself if you refuse to commit to mortality or anything, for that matter, because you are afraid. Are you afraid to risk your happiness, a pathetic concept indeed, at the hands of good? Yes, you are afraid. I know you are because you are here in my room. Perhaps you are afraid to the point of having convinced yourself that there is no morality. There is just you. Selfish people are only self-absorbed because they are afraid, and selfish people are not good people. So please, do call me f a freak. Curse my name under your breath as you read my words. Say it. Curse you, irrelevant. I cannot stop you, and why would I? The only difference between you and I is that I am honest, and honestly, we are all cowards. Of course, it is here that I should apologize, though I do not fully understand why. It is obvious that I am a negative soul, and it is obvious that most people are blissfully stupid to the point of being what I venomously describe as optimistic, so I imagine my barrage of weaponized reality is devastating. No, not devastating. Pity. That's what you feel, isn't it? Ha! You absolute dullard. I take back my apology. Of course, that's what you feel because you only ever feel like the rest of the poor buffoons who feel before they think. Thus you make your thoughts irrelevant like me. You're not even internalizing the actual implications of my negativity, are you? With each passing remark of the absolutely absolute ridiculousness of reality, you wonder what wound I hold that makes me twisted. With each jab at your preposterous notions of self-worth, you imagine me experiencing some trauma that ruined my psyche forever. Be it the death of a loved one, molestation, torture, abuse, or perhaps the fall itself. You wonder what happened to me. Well, let us remove the fog. The reason I am negative is because I am not totally moronic. Yes, that is all. I am just barely intelligent to see the vanity of every last piece of this universe. Are you now shifting your thoughts? Are you now supposing that I am simply insane, thus moving from pity to disgust? I have heard the ceaseless echoes of your popular psychology reader, and they do not move me. The repeated assertions of a broken mind that you claim are born of your own intuitions are wholly weightless, and your ironically patronizing desire to comfort me in this realization simply shows your complete neglect for critical thought. You feel what you f want to feel, and think as a result. Idiocy. For as long as I am alive, I will think before I feel. My thoughts lead me to the conclusion that there is nothing but void, and I will feel accordingly. The final assumption of my character is on the horizon. Soon, you will imagine me to be enjoying my negativity, from pity to disgust to hatred. You'll arrive at a place where I am like the others who wallow in their own pathetic nature, as if perceived sadness is a style of clothing that I can don to foster some notion of uniqueness. If I were like them, I would value myself as an individual. To do so would be to ignore sense. You are wrong. But you are wrong for a different reason than you might suspect. It is not that I am it is not that the inverse of your assumption is true. That is to say, I am not deeply depressed or saddened by the vanity of everything. 
consider what I told you before. This is not the sort of morbid sense that is born of sadness. No, I am morbid because I recognize the hollow nature of life. You cannot escape the fact that I am not a wounded animal to be pitied. I am not so insane as to be wrong, and I am certainly not masturbatory in my recognition of pointlessness. These buffers of assumption you place between your world and mine are as pathetic as your pursuit of happiness. So, please spare me your bloated assumptions of emotional damage and engage my assertions with some semblance of reason. At least make the attempt to discuss with me on my own terms, that is, intelligent terms, not that I am uniquely gifted with intellect. On the contrary, I believe that I am somewhat dense relative to most minds. You, on the other hand, refuse to use your intelligence, and I have no patience for that. So I suggest you stop reading this now if you are so inclined to continue analyzing my psychology with all the ability and intuition of an ape, simply to create obstacles between the truth of what I am saying and the concept of your reality. I am not unique, I am not especially intelligent, and by no means am I attractive. I am certainly not interesting. However, I am right. Therefore, the better methodology is that of conflict. Rather than enduring your condescending attempts at psychoanalysis, I invite you to converse with me, engage in arguments, argumentation as if we were playing chess. Sit down where I sat before at this desk and do battle with my ideas. Put aside your archetypal, pon archetypal pondering for just long enough to see my pieces on the board and react to them using the rules of the game. After all, such an engagement is a statement of respect. I've shown my respect for you, reader. I want to argue with you, and I would not if I did not believe that you were capable of reciprocating. And add meaning to this drivel by understanding it. Admittedly, I do not presume to be right, meaning I assume that you are wrong, as I know you disagree with me. I know you have a far less negative view of the world, but I respect your intelligence all the same, even if the smartest minds can hold the stupidest ideas simply because they refuse to try. Note, th Note 3, 9th of January, yeah. I forgot to mention something in my last note. I forgot to tell you about Momo's prized possession. Indeed, this single object is more important than the whole of my life. It is essentially sacred. Although it is not religious or even spiritually oriented, this book, this tome, if you will, is your key to the vasts of humanity. Above my desk, just below the wooden trim that remains on the ceiling, you will see a hole covered by some stretched leather from an old glove. If you remove this covering, you'll see a small hollow. In this hollow is the greatest treasure you will find in all your scavenging. Bound in cloth and elastic string for your preservation, my dictionary with an attached cyclopedia sits in the dark, waiting for you to discover it. This single book allows you to understand my rambling. More importantly, it is a window into the old world. By nature of not, by nature of not knowing the old world, you are re relatively ignorant. You should not worry, and I should hope that you are not so easily offended, as ignorance is not something that anyone can truly fault, at least not legitimately. To some extent, you cannot legitimately fault anyone for stupidity either. Intelligence can certainly be trained, so there is at least marginal room for fault. But the true culprit of our intellectual downfall is a lack of creativity. In my experience, creativity is nothing but a willingness to use one's intelligence to understand the connected nature of data. Understanding itself is a creation, and this dictionary provides you with a wellspring of data. You, can, you actually have a psychological advantage over the people of old because data is sparser than it was before. You have a drive to collect it. Before, we had structures built to feed us data, regardless of whether we wanted it or found it useful. Oh, and on that note, I should say that not all of the data in this dictionary will be useful to you. Do not attempt to memorize all the words in our language, as that would be ridiculous and chiefly a waste of time. 
Rather, think of this new wellspring as a companion. I have other books from times of old scattered throughout this room, and your new guide will help you navigate their secret. Search for them search search them for clues like you searched my residence. Scavenge them for knowledge like you would scavenge food. If you do not trust their worth, allow me to use my life as an example. Factual data, especially if anecdotal, has a way of leading people to truth without taking them through the muddy waters of personal bias and comfort. Yes, it is somehow remains authentic by nature of it being personal all the same. Anyway, when I was young, very young, I was expected to learn about the world. It was similar to how young people are expected to learn of survival now. However, in the comfort of the old world, survival was pushed aside to make way for broader and more important topics, such as the history of humanity, her thought, and her struggles. From this data, we could learn a great many things about life and how to proceed. And there were many ways of acquiring this material. One method was that of schooling. The assumption was that there are people who are more capable than others when it comes to passing knowledge on to children. We call these people teachers or professors. These were held on high as the achievement of thought. They were regarded as the paragon of all learning and the final bastion of reality in society. Unfortunately, the structure was complete nonsense. We neglected a core principle of learning to make way for our pride and our sense of safety. We forgot that people learn when they are interested. Are you interested in your new companion? Perhaps not yet. But you will when you are presented with a problem that only your companion can solve. Comfort eliminated our problems, so we had to create them artificially. Children tend to be smarter than us by nature of not having the chance to kill their own creativity. So when they quickly saw the ruse for what it was, and interest died, thus learning died with it. What we were left with was an extremely inefficient method of communication that was not interesting in and of itself was, did not evolve the presentation of any interesting material. Some of us benefited, though, and some of us simply adopted the structure out of hubris, as if memorization were something to be proud of. The arrogance of these individuals contributed to enormous heaps of information. They sat atop their mound of unused data, thinking they had climbed the highest mountain, when in reality, all they managed to do was smother their own intelligence. I was lucky that I was not subjected to this method of communication. At least, I was not immediately subjected to it. My parents were somewhat unique in that they allowed me to learn autonomously. In the old world, we had buildings that existed as storerooms for books. I have my own library behind me on the metal shelves, but it is nothing compared to the sheer scale of these collections. Imagine almost limitless amounts of knowledge and thought contained in a single building. A, ga a grander thought I have never conjured, and to think it is a memory. It is a memory of something that actually existed. What fools we were to ignore its worth. It is gone now, but I experienced it. Do you know how to teach a child to swim? One way is to describe the motions to the child. You can even describe buoyancy and the basic properties of water. Still another method is to simply throw the child into the ocean, expecting the child to either die in the deep or learn through an extremely troubling experience. Neither of these methods are ideal. What would happen if you give a child a rowboat? Better yet, give the child a galleon. The child may never learn to swim, admittedly. In fact, the child may never, never leave the boat at all. But some children will not be able to, saw, able to tame their interest for long. Some children will see the water from the boat, and they will dive in. Luckily, the ocean is vast, and there are many places to explore and find interest in. So the other children would not be far behind. I can still recall the words of my parents as they left me at the library for countless hours. Go and learn, they said. Never was I given a direction. Never was I tested. No. I explored. You might be tempted to think that I was alone, but you would be wrong. I was participating in the full breadth of human existence. I stood beside great men and women as I was given their secrets. Their correct and their false information. All of it painted a picture of reality that became more interesting as it unfolded. Like you, I found a great treasure, and I used it where I found interest. The others did not approve of this methodology, I'm afraid. Do you want to know why? 
it was because they were afraid. They avoided learning for the same reason that we are all evil, or cowards. In this setting, their greatest fear was being wrong. So they adopted standard content told in standard ways. Standard things are not interesting things. Everything I learned from reading the various texts in the library was a true discovery. Value was based on my reaction. So what I learned was, of course, sporadic. I learned about astronomy. I dipped into mathematics. Marine biology became important to me, and literature of almost all kinds was my love. I learned everything I could about everything that seemed important because it was in front of me for a limited time, and there were others who learned this way as well. They were few in number, but they existed. I spoke with one such child when I was of a similar age, and we discussed what we had discovered. I could see the same spark of exploration in his eyes that I was undoubtedly present in mine. Everything was new. There's no sense of pride in any of it, either. We both learned different things, and when the learning overlapped, it was a coincidence that gave way to acquaintance. When our findings differed, the experience pursued, produced sharing. On the other hand, when I talked to the countless hordes of horrid children from the schooling system, every piece of information was a medal they wore on their chest with the most disgusting sense of achievement. If I shared my findings related to a children's novel or perhaps an obscure work of fiction, I was met with the same repeated Shakespearean drivel. You haven't read Romeo and Juliet? Are you slow or something? I had to read that in the fourth grade. I was told, what I learned was not important because it was not standard. A great portion of thought was completely wiped out because it was not some test given by some dry and dusty moron with some chalk and a piece of paper that dictates who is and who is not a member of the upper echelon of intellectual success. I don't like the work of Shakespeare. I find it to be void of any interest, interesting content and entirely worthless, but that was simply my interest speaking. If some other child found it to be interesting, I would have been in no position to assert anything objective. What I found interesting was so because I am a part of the diverse pool of humans. Not so with school, it seems. Shakespeare was arbitrarily deemed essential to the knowledge of all life, and to not be interested in Shakespeare's shoddy and absurdly uninteresting drool was to declare oneself an idiot of the highest order. Yes, I was a moron because I did not swoon over the poorly constructed plays of some dead wordsmith, who was so unable to use his language that he resorted to simply making up his own. At least, that is some form of creativity, I suppose. In truth, the hideous nature of the other children was only in part due to the structure they were subjected to. The other factors, such as their social climate, rather than placing them in the context of the full range of humanity, allowing for maximum experience, Parents place their children on an industrial track only with those of the same year group. The practice is similar to defacing, defecating into a paper bag and breathing into it until passing out. We took the underdeveloped nature of humans and amplified it by leaving them alone together, creating what is undoubtedly the most toxic environment in all of human history. At the end of it, we called it childhood. We called it growth. We labeled it normal and continued as if Every human went through a phase of debauchery. Where was my phase of debauchery? Where were my adolescent days? I do not recall experiencing such a reckless and stupid era of my life that I was to grow out of. In reality, the effects of this veritable toxin simply wore off over the course of the few years after this climate was enjoyed. Oh, how normal it was. Yes, the drunkenness, the pure and self-induced idiocy, the sexual behavior that only accomplished an emotional destruction in later years, and the absolutely foul smugness of each and every stupid boy and girl that was manufactured into the same moronic scum over and over. Yes, a phase. Yes, normal. Absolutely preposterous. But, my dear reader, you are exempt from this structure. You have escaped it through the timing of your birth. I congratulate you. It is fitting, indeed, that I was unable to avoid its fruits. It is my punishment for being worthless. Ah, but it's all worthless. No matter. You have a companion, and you can use it to understand the universe. You have, within your grasp, one of the last keys that which is truly important. You have a key to that which is grand, and you will not defile it with any sort of trained idiocy. Your new companion will help you if you are interested, and you see, that is just the point. I am not giving you an instruction on what to learn. Rather, I am simply 
giving you the instruction to learn. Your interest will guide your galleon, and all must and all you must be willing must be is willing to sail. Yikes.